All right, everyone. So today our course, uh, our class is going to be uh, discussing the Victorian age and um, uh, Wuthering Heights. It was published in 1847 by Emily uh, Bronte. So there are basic principles for you to keep in mind when you are studying literature in this class and any class. For those of you who were my students in A230A, I think you already, uh, you're familiar with these. For those of you who were not my students in A230A, um, I need you to, uh, keep, uh, to, to, to keep these in mind and to, to familiarize yourself with these um, uh, principles uh, as you read and understand uh, literature, to always historicize um, literary texts and to always consider each text as a specimen of a larger historical and contextual phenomenon, but also to look for what is special about this um, text. Uh, always consider uh, the literary properties of each text, but also look at how each text might function in its larger cultural context. And to always consider the relevance of each text to our own lives in today's world. Um, to always also be aware of when a text was written um, because certain texts can be set, for example, um, Wuthering Heights, the, the text that we're going to be st studying, um, it, is, it begins in the 18th century and it ends at the very beginning of the 19th century. But Emily Bronte, the author who wrote it, she wrote it in the middle of the 19th century. And so it is important for us to keep all these things in mind. Um, when you have a narrative, a story, try to determine and know when the action of the narrative takes place. We're gonna see an example um, uh, with Wuthering Heights. Uh, when you read a text, with, uh, read it within the context of what was going on in the world around it. What was happening in England around the time that Wuthering Heights it was written, what was happening historically, uh, culturally, uh, politically, economically, um, and ideologically, um, and what was happening worldwide. What's the connection of England to the rest of the world around that time? All of that is very important for our purposes because it gives you a better understanding and a better feel of the world of the novel and what was basically happening. More importantly, ask how the text is affected by the larger process of history which is historicizing, is history moving forward. How is this text basically participating in the process of uh, history? Uh, this is the Marxist model of history. Uh, if you remember from A to 30A, we discussed that the European history, uh, there is a, a historical, there is a model, a consensus historical model that has been established in the 19th century about the uh, model of history for Europe falling into or having three principal categories. We have the classical period of Greece and Rome. And then we have the fall of the Roman Empire. Then we have the medieval times that we have discussed in A to 30A, which were um, informed and controlled by a feudal system, economically and politically by the landed uh, aristocracy. And that era um, is also called, or it had a designation as the Dark Ages. Why were medieval times called the Dark Ages? Because it was a dark period for European, um, uh, uh, for all of Europe, that they were plunged and stagnant in terms of no cultural advancement, no um, cultural and new cultural energies. Um, their feudal system was a very uh, a, a part of the ancient regime, uh, old style, basically regime. And then after that, after the 1000 years of medieval uh, darkness, basically, uh, we have the Renaissance, the times of the Renaissance, if you remember from A to 30A, when we basically had started to have new energies in uh, Europe uh, and um, more modernizing energies um, that happened during the Renaissance time. And then after the Renaissance, we move forward to more modern 
times that are informed by a capitalist system. Um, and then if you remember, we went, uh, we, we covered the Enlightenment uh, period in, in Europe, specifically France by Voltaire, and then basically that uh, we move forward. We still are under basically late capitalism as of today. Hope, hopefully, according to Marx, we, were, we will have a workers' revolution, a proletarian revolution that will lead the world ultimately to be um, under socialism. So this historical model is very important for you to understand where we are. So because if we move to 19th century um, England, then we know that the bourgeoisie that we discussed, the bourgeoisie who um, gained more prominence and were uh, becoming more powerful during the Renaissance onward were basically the real ruling class of all of Europe by uh, the 17th, 18th century. And so by the 19th century, which is the time of uh, the, this novel, Wuthering Heights, the uh, bourgeoisie were the ruling class, have been the ruling class of Europe. All right. So what is the context of Wuthering Heights, the story that we will be um, studying? Um, where does it uh, take place? It is important to know the location of uh, the novel. So the action takes place on or near the Earnshaw estate. It's in a place that's in north, uh, north of England, known as Wuthering Heights. Um, uh, Emily Bronte was actually inspired by, by a real uh, location that's called Top Withens. It's an abandoned uh, farm um, house. Uh, she had also other inspirations uh, because her novel is really um, uh, influenced by a gothic atmosphere. Once you start reading the novel, you will um, understand what I'm talking about. And so uh, probably she uh, we know that Emily Bronte visited uh, um, uh, High Sunderland uh, Hall and it was probably as a child and it, that, that place uh, inspired her when she was um, uh, writing Wuthering Heights and um, creating the uh, characteristics of the house in Wuthering Heights and the surrounding um, area. The environs of Wuthering Heights, um, the, the novel is set in a remote and cold and barren area um, in Northern England known as Yorkshire. Um, the topography um, of the area is hilly and rough and it's marked by moorlands and moors. Um, and the moorlands uh, are basically hilly and windy and sometimes have a lot of rain and snow. They have mostly grass and shrubs uh, and a few trees. Um, also the um, area is really dreary and largely empty which really is the perfect setting for a gothic uh, fiction. And that's what Emily Bronte in intended for her novel. Um, there are other novelists of the time who wrote um, novels that are set in similar uh, settings. Uh, Yorkshire and Great Britain. So if you look, here's Yorkshire. When you're looking at um, Great Britain and a map of it, here is Northern Ireland that we're going to look at later in this semester or not. Um, the Republic of Ireland is here. Um, the location of Britain in all of Europe is also on this map. Right. Also, if you look at Russia, Ukraine, Romania, how was um, uh, Britain basically connected to the rest of this um, world? All right, so when does Wuthering Heights take place? When does Emily Bronte set her novel? She starts the very first events of the novel in 1771. So basically not in the 19th century, in the 18th century, 1771. So the boy Heathcliff, who is the protagonist of this novel, or one of the protagonists of this novel, is brought by Mr. Earnshaw to Wuthering Heights. Um, and Wuthering Heights is basically a house that is built in the 1500. All right, it's a very old um, a house. Uh, the last events of the novel or action that is narrated of the novel 
is basically in 1803, the very, very beginning of 19th century. So we as students of literature who are trying to understand the cultural context and we're trying to historicize the events of the novel, we need to know what was going on in English history between 1771 and 1803 to understand the context of the action that happens in Wuthering Heights. I mean, the same way that we did in 830A when we were trying to understand what was before the Renaissance and what came after the Renaissance and what was happening culturally, politically, um, economically during the Renaissance. We know that the bourgeoisie struggled a lot um, during the Middle Ages in order to gain momentum. They ultimately gained momentum, we know, with the discovery of uh, America and the pouring of all the gold uh, and all the agriculture enterprise back in Europe, the bourgeoisie ultimately gained that momentum and became the real ruling class um, um, of Europe. So these are key events in English history between 1771 and 1803. Um, we have a, a King George III was officially king of England, but he suffered from mental illnesses and he was uh, replaced by a regent in 1810. Uh, um, so a lot of, um, basically a lot of turmoil was happening in the British monarchy around that time. 1771 to 1783, we had the American Revolution and War of Independence. And so Britain could not basically focus on continuous war with the United States. And so they decided to shift their colonial emphasis to India and the East. Colonialism is very important for our purposes in this class because um, your book emphasizes the relation of home and abroad, the relationship of England with the rest of their colonial uh, world that they were basically engaged in, um, in continuous wars, um, um, occupation, etc. Uh, so uh, in 1793 to 1815, Britain also engaged in almost continuous warfare, like I said, revolutionary, and uh, especially with uh, um, Napoleonic wars in France. Uh, in 1800, the Act of Union adds Ireland to the United Kingdom of uh, Britain. That is basically England, Scotland, and uh, Wales. All right, other key dates. Uh, this also shows you the connection of the British world and the British Empire with Kuwait, with the Arab world. I will leave this for you to read it later on, but I have this slide for you in order for you to have a better understanding and feel of the, the British, um, basically, uh, um, uh, the, the permeation of a British culture and political rule throughout um, the world. All right. Um, also, uh, a general historical situation that uh, surrounds the action of Wuthering Heights is that um, it happens, the novel takes place at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in England, uh, which is a basically one of the most important um, um, things to happen or events to happen in uh, human history and European history in particular. We have an increasing gap between rural areas around this time of England and that are still largely traditional. So we have areas that are becoming more urban and urbanizing, becoming more modern. And we have areas that are still largely traditional. And we're going to see this in Wuthering Heights. Um, then when, when Britain, of course, lost uh, American colonies, this led to an increasing, increasing emphasis on uh, Britain's um, Asian and Indian and Pacific, especially Australian um, colonies. And we're going to see their emphasis on their uh, Indian colonies in the second work that we're going to be reading by uh, Conan Doyle. And uh, Napoleon also begins to sweep um, across Europe um, bringing with him the modern ideas of the French Revolution. Um, all right, so modernization and the novel. So the novel, you understand, is a product of, moder of modernity, all right? And the novel is also a commodity. 
which is completely associated with the rise of the bourgeois power. Um, Wuthering Heights is set at a time when capitalist modernization is beginning to disrupt the traditional life of the countryside in England. Now, Heathcliff, who enters the world of Yorkshire and the world of Wuthering Heights, is considered an outsider who comes into conflict with what? Traditional life. And can be read, we can read the character of Heathcliff as an emblem, as a symbol of capitalist modernization that sweeps in, comes into any traditional society, and irrevocably, the society is changed in, um, uh, in a way that cannot be recovered, all right? So uh, we don't care if Heathcliff is Irish or a vampire or um, uh, that does not change the fact that this character stands as an emblem of capitalist modernization. So please keep that in mind as you read the novel. Um, we can also compare Tom Hardy's a novel, Jude the Obscure, that was published in 1895 um, at the end of the 19th century. It narrates a time when this process of capitalist modernization um, is much more advanced. It's almost complete. And where this traditional life is completely, what? Gone. It's not even here. It's not even there. Now, when Wuthering Heights um, was written, the capitalist modernization was still underway. But by the time that Hardy uh, published Jude the Obscure, that that uh, process of capitalist modernization was almost complete and traditional societies and rural societies have been swept away by, by that modernization. Now, Victorian England and the emergent bourgeoisie, the ruling class of Europe. Um, if we go back um, really fast, giving you this historical backdrop, uh, you know, the Middle Ages lasted around 1,000 years, and Europe was dominated by an, aristoc an aristocracy that was controlling every aspect in terms of politics and economy. Feudal system marked that. And then we also had the Catholic Church that were allied with the aristocracy, who basically provided the ideological um, and uh, uh, the, the, the ideological aspects and cultural aspects. Uh, the hegemonic, if you may, the hegemonic um, uh, control over uh, ideology and over uh, the cultural aspects. So during this uh, period, uh, we know from A to 30A that uh, commerce was uh, denigrated. Uh, people uh, during that time, especially the aristocracy that wanted their position to remain unthreatened, did not want anyone uh, to do uh, commerce. They did not want people to trade. And we know that merchants were denigrated and they were considered basically the downtrodden, the wretched of the earth. Um, now, after that, with the coming of capitalist modernization that you cannot compete with, one thing that you need to know in order to understand European history and European novels better is that capitalism is an unstoppable force. You can try to resist capitalism, but you will just fail. The only way that capitalism can ever fall or collapse is for it to collapse beneath its own weight by basically um, uh, expanding and not being able to, uh, losing control, basically. So those merchants that were considered the downtrodden people during middle medieval time ultimately rose to power and they became the real ruling class throughout Europe. And uh, they were first named the middle class. And I've already told you in A to 30A, that is, it's a, um, basically, it's, it's, it, it wouldn't be accurate to call them middle class, especially by the, the 18th and 19th century, since they became the real ruling class of Europe um, I prefer that you call them the bourgeoisie, who swept away the old order in Europe, the ancient regime, by their revolutionary force. They were very revolutionary, and they took over. They became the real ruling class of Europe. So when was Wuthering Heights written? Between 1845 to 1846. It was published in 1847. 
um, the novel is considered an early Victorian uh, work because it is written during the Victorian age. However, um, it is set at a time when the Industrial Revolution was really high in gear, all right? And it was written also at a time when bourgeois ideology was not revolutionary anymore. All right, so we know that the bourgeoisie fought against the aristocracy in order to establish, all right, um, their rule in order to establish a position for themselves. However, once the bourgeoisie were uh, more enabled, when they became the true ruling class of Europe, they become stod they be they have become stodgy. They became conservative, and they became socially conformist. Those people who were once upon a time very revolutionary decided to entrench that dominance and they grew morally conservative. And so I want you to keep that in mind as you also read um, Mothering Heights. Queen, Vic Queen Victoria um, uh, lived from 1837 to um, uh, 1901, barely made it into the 20th century. Those are key events that happened during the reign of uh, Queen Victoria, AKA the Victorian age. 1848, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels published the Communist Manifesto. In 1851, the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nations declared Britain's com commitment to modernity and empire. That is very important for our purposes because it shows the extent to uh, that Britain uh, basically was um, um, connected uh, to the rest of the world and the relationship between empire and other um, um, and, uh, other places. In 1857, we had the Indian mutiny or the rebellion in India. In 1858, the British government assumes control of India from the British East India Company. Um, Charles Darwin in 1859 published the origins, the origin of species, um, um, which is a work that is unprecedented in terms of its importance of talking about um, uh, the origins of all living things. Uh, and Victorians were really obsessed, and we're going to see this in the sign of four, when we study the sign of four, Victorians were really obsessed with um, uh, science, uh, and basically every Victorian uh, from the middle class was an amateur scientist. Uh, 1877, Victoria declared uh, was declared Empress of India uh, in order to make their rule more formal uh, in uh, India. Um, in 1884 to 1885, we had the Berlin Conference that formalizes plans to colonize Africa and to divide it among uh, uh, European uh, powers. Um, in 1898, colonial wars of Sudan and South Africa mark a decline in imperial confidence and British uh, imperial confidence. This is the Crystal Palace, and it's considered a symbol of the great exhibition that I mentioned in 1851. And it's a symbol of modernity in Victorian England. Um, of course, the uh, exhibit also included an array of Orientalist exhibits. So this really shows you the connection of England to the East, the Middle East, all right, that um, they had Victorian Orientalism around that time that is uh, clear in the art that they had. Uh, this is Alhamra Tower in Kuwait, which is a symbol of modernity that shows you that modernism is and postmodernism is a global phenomenon. All right, so key characteristics of the Victorian age in England. That age was marked by certain characteristics. As I said, the bourgeoisie, they became more stodgy at the beginning of the 19th century. They had repressive moral conservatism. They had strictly established gender roles within, with middle class and upper class women. 
they were largely con uh, confined to uh, the domestic sphere. Uh, women, they don't go out, they don't work. And of course, we're not talking here about working class women because working class women went to factories, they, they were exploited, they are not even part of this world. So please keep in mind, when we are talking about Victorian women and like how they sat at home and took care of the husband and did all of that, we are strictly speaking about middle class women. And like I told you, the designation that I prefer is bourgeois women, okay? So we also had an increasing dedication to science, as I just mentioned earlier, as a mode for understanding the world. So Victorians were completely obsessed with using science and science scientific inqu in inquiry when trying to understand and rationalize events that are happening around us in the world. This also was accompanied by an increasing dedication to the industrial modernization. Again, that goes with the capitalist um, uh, industry that was um, in high gear, like I mentioned earlier. Um, we also had an increasing commitment to imperial expansion. So Britain was like still trying to expand, still trying to further their imperial um, uh, interest in the rest of the world. Victorian domesticity. What are the basic what are the basic principles um, pertaining to that? The ideal of feminine domesticity for upper class Victorian women. Um, was embodied by a figure of the angel of the house. Who is this angel of the house? Who is she supposed to be? Basically, this is a term that is taken from a poem by a Victorian um, um, poet, uh, Coventry Patmore. Uh, this poem actually was written um, in 1854. It wasn't really famous in America. It was more famous in the United States. Um, uh, it was really largely ignored in Britain, but later on it became, in the later part of the 19th century, it gained more prominence in, um, in Britain. So the angel of the house is a modest woman. She is self-sacrificing. She is nurturing and she devotes herself to her husband and her family. But again, like I said, keep in mind that this angel of the house does not cook, does not clean the house because she's still a bourgeois woman. So she just basically sits around and takes care of everyone, nurtures everyone, all right? So that's what she does. And again, like I said, this does not apply to working class women. Now, we have a character in the novel because once you start reading the novel, hopefully starting today, you, you will start uh, getting familiarized with the characters and know how they're like. Catherine, okay, who is a major um, a character in the novel, um, by nature is not an angel figure. And that's gonna cause and create a lot of problems for this character who defies the prescribed role that the society endows, all right? So as she tells Nelly, Nelly is a maid um, in the house. She's their maid. And uh, basically Catherine tells her, if I were in heaven, Nelly, I should be extremely miserable. I dreamt once that I was there and that heaven did not seem to be my home. And I broke my heart with weeping to come back to earth. And the angels were so angry that they flung me out in the middle of the heath on top of Wuthering Heights where I woke up sobbing for joy. So we have here a rebellious figure. You still haven't read the novel, you guys. So I understand that you still don't know what is going on. But as soon as you start reading the novel and you start knowing and you're, you start uh, getting familiar with the character of Catherine Earnshaw, you will understand that this quotation here, all right, that I'm presenting for you uh, is an indication of her um, rebellious nature. She's a woman who defies the, uh, the um, uh, basically, uh, what the society deems as acceptable, what is expected of her, her role as a woman, a person who is supposed to follow the feminine conduct of what is fine, according to Victorians. So we learn little by little that this woman is a rebellious figure. So that's an indication, first indication that this novel does not necessarily follow a certain um, uh, structure. 
the Victorian uh, separate sphere theory of gender. Now, like I said, those Victorians um, thought that there is a realm of activity that is appropriate for women and a realm of activity that is appropriate for men. For women, it's basically domesticity, childbearing, homemaking, being at home, and that they should never go outside, all right? And another realm is appropriate for men, which is the realm of business, politics, and action, which is outside the house. Now, um, the notion of this of, of the separate spheres um, is going to be important for our purposes because um, it it doesn't only correspond to the feminine realm versus the masculine realm. It also co corresponds to the idea of Britain being home and the rest of the world being abroad. So we can also think of England as being the domestic realm and the rest of the world as being the, um, uh, uh, as being basically uh, the outside uh, realm, all right, or the realm of abroad. So uh, of course, there are recent femini feminist scholars who uh, demolished or deconstructed the notion of the separate spheres. Um, uh, and they basically said that there is no distinction between home and abroad, and that they are interconnected at all times, that you can never separate these two worlds. Same applies to England. If you want to think of England as home and the rest of the world as abroad, if England is going and colonizing all these places around the world, how do they expect to be separate from the rest of the world? If you go and colonize India, then India is going to show up at your do uh, uh, doorstep. So you cannot go and invade other locales and just expect that they will never be part of your own world. So please keep that in mind. Um, Weathering Heights, the novel, is built on a certain contrast. So we're going to look at that. Um, a very important and prominent uh, cultural theorist, Raymond Williams, Raymond Williams, uh, pointed out that Wuthering Heights would not be very interesting if it stood alone without an opposition. Once you start reading the novel, you will see that we have a house in the story called Wuthering Heights, and we have a contrasting house that stands opposite to it that's called uh, Thresh Cross Grange. These two houses are always throughout the entire novel being compared to each other as being contrasts to each other. But we will discover and we will realize by the end of the novel that these houses are probably not that, that there isn't a big disparity between them, that they're not like that far off from each other. So we're gonna start to unfold and understand all these nuances as we move uh, forward. Um, we also have um, uh, class is a major issue in Wuthering Heights that prevents our two protagonists, the main characters, Catherine and Heathcliff, from being together. And so we're going to look at issues of class. Heathcliff um, attempts uh, through the course of the novel to transcend the opposition um, of uh, the opposition of uh, um, uh, the binary opposition of poor, rich. A person with um, uh, with a genealogy versus a person who is basically uh, with the uh, with, with with no origins. Okay, and so Heathcliff tries to transcend that by getting rich, but he doesn't succeed. Uh, people don't accept him, even though he goes away, he brings all that money, he comes back, he is still considered an outsider to the society of Yorkshire. Why? We're going to try to understand that when we um, think more about that, uh, the rigid uh, moral codes of this um, Victorian culture. Now, we have also a second generation story. So, guys, in this very rich novel, um, we have multiple layers of stories. We have uh, a first generation story that is marked by the death of um, Catherine and um, the inability of Heathcliff to transcend his position. And then we also have the second generation story of Catherine's daughter, Kathy, and um, with her uh, cousin, uh, 
um, and Heathcliff's also uh, Heathcliff's son. So, I mean, it's a little complicated. You need to familiarize yourself with all the names, with all the characters. Please do that um, uh, throughout this week. Try to familiarize yourself with all these names. Go back to my lecture and try to connect all these dots. Heathcliff ultimately uh, and Kathy come from different classes and different backgrounds. And we understand that this is something that is hard to overcome. They will not even overcome it, all right? Because they will not get married. They will not have a happily ever after story. But Hareton and the younger Kathy, they come from similar backgrounds. Uh, even though throughout the story, Hareton is treated as a servant and he is relegated to a lower status, but ultimately he rises back to his rightful status and he is able to marry Kathy and live happily ever after. This tells us something about class structure, rigid class structure. And I think you're kind of familiar with the idea of rigid class structure from A to 30A, but it is, uh, of course, different here because of the situation of the bourgeoisie um, in England in uh, 19, the 19th century. This is the British Empire in 1815. This is the British Empire in 1920s. The Victorian novel. Um, the, Vic the Victorian novel was the dominant form of literature during the 19th century. So. 